And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today, because um, especially in e-commerce, which is the area I'm going to focus on today, obviously we operate in both banking and e-commerce, um, but in e-commerce space, many of us have experienced some, some lesser than good um, customer experience. And today I want to sort of show you why and, and how it doesn't have to be that way. And that some of the things that you're you're sort of used to seeing, you really should not be used to seeing. It's just, you know, poor customer experience in the 21st century. Uh, so as I mentioned, I've actually been in fraud mitigation for about 10 years, 11 years now today. And uh, I'm based in Alpharetta, Georgia, northern suburbs of Atlanta. So why should you care about any of this? Well, you should care because, um, like, like I tell many customers, um, fr fraud is, is there whether you like it or not. Um, the only reason someone tells me they don't have fraud is I usually ask them, does no one want the products you have? And obviously the more desirable your products are, um, the more fraud you're likely to have. And if you're a recognized name brand, uh, you're going to see significantly more fraud than others. Another trend that's been happening in the industry, which is for fidelity reasons, um, merchants really want you to create an account and store your payment details and make it very very easy for you to to check out well guess what that makes it really really easy also for fraudsters to to operate and as merchants have gone down that road um you know account takeover has been a real phenomenon that, that we've seen and they have access typically to the stored payment on file and you can see here some of the numbers that, that's absolutely crazy over the last couple of years. And the other thing when you force people to, to create an account is you're going to see a lot of fake identities um, that are going to be used. Those fake identities could be used for stuff I would call semi-malicious, such as sort of um, like if you say one per customer on a promotion or something like that, uh, the customer might create two or three accounts, that's fine. You know, you're probably tolerating that. But um, someone creating a thousand accounts or ten thousand accounts, um, I was speaking to to a bank in Europe that had a hundred and fifty euro, um, you know, fee uh, sort of uh, award for opening a new account, um, and uh, forty percent of all of the accounts that were open were fraudulent. Right, so that's the kind of stuff you're going to see. And really, uh, fraud, fraudsters use use a gamut of payments that uh, that we've seen, and and I could spend the rest of the day telling you about some of the amazing schemes that we've seen over the last years. Um, but, but I'll spare you that. Maybe, maybe if you guys go to MRC or somewhere like that, we can, uh, we can have a lovely chat about that. Anyway, so, so what's happening in the industry? Sort of, if you look at what's available out there today, there's a number of players and certainly layered security is the way to go for a merchant, right? Um, I often use the analogy of a car, right? When airbikes came out, they didn't take out seatbelts. And when automatic braking came on, they didn't take out the airbags, right? You want as much security as you, as you can afford to have to make it the, the best experience possible, right? And, and here is the same thing. And I've divided the, the sort of, um, you know, levels of protection into three major buckets. So the first bucket, which was kind of the first bucket to exist about 15 years ago, was the transactional data. So this is all of the data that you get sort of in a, in a payload, you know, in, in a transaction typically uh, operates a checkout, you know, where you have people's names, address, or static information that, as you heard from many of the other people on the, on the webinar today, can be easily stolen. Uh, and most of the fraudsters have access to that information. Um, and so while it was really great in 2006, um, in 2021, uh, it's still a very important aspect of fraud mitigation but certainly as a standalone solution, uh, doesn't really uh, meet all of the criteria. And in some cases can create a lot, of, uh, a lot of false positive and not detect the actual fraudsters. So then what happened probably about five to seven years after that, really the device data came into play. And the device data is really all about, um, you know, the, the, the uh, tool that you're using to access the merchant's website or mobile app, right? And in the, in the case when it was created, most people were accessing online shopping through a computer, right? And um, spoofing a computer and recreating a computer was really, really difficult. But what happened in, in sort of the last eight to 10 years 
is mobile commerce appeared and mobile devices were, um, you know, in some cases, a, a predominant way of accessing the merchant's website. And cloning a phone using an emulator and um, wiping and cleaning a phone was so easy that really we ended up being the, the good users getting caught up in the net. And the fraudsters could really find their way around because they could appear as a completely new device in only a few minutes and, and not, not impact the rest. And so what we've done, and I think others also on this, um, on this call today, is really focused on that behavioral data. We said, we need to know what's happening during that session in order to be able to detect intent. And that's really what we're looking for here. We're looking for intent. And there's two things that we're looking for in that intent. Firstly, we want to know if it's a human being or not. You've heard the word bot over and over again in, in many of the presentations here. And I don't think I speak to merchants that don't have a bot problem unless you're on you know, sort of lesser known brands, right? Most of the bots come from specific territories. You have to be more of an international recognized brand. If you're a more US centric brand or, or, or uh, you know, even regional brand within the US or within Europe, um, you know, people may not have heard of you as much. And really here, what's, what we look at is the behavioral patterns and the behavioral anomalies. Are you a human or are you a machine? And then if you are a human, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to defraud the merchant? Or are you actually trying to defraud someone? And I'll explain that into in a few seconds. But really, that allows you for early detection. What early detection does, it allows two things. One, it allows to limit damage, right? If you're detecting stuff early, the fraudster has a lot less opportunity to do damage. And secondly, you still have the user behind the screen. So you're not a black and white zero or one where, okay, the user's gone. Now I have this transaction. I have to decide what to do with it. If I accept it and I'm wrong, I get fraud. If I decline it and I'm wrong, I get an upset customer and lost business. And that's what a majority of merchants have to deal with to some extent when someone's left their ecosystem, obviously there's ways you can call them and all of that, but that becomes really expensive and troublesome. You may not get a hold of them. Um, so, so shopping, especially cross-border, um, makes it very, um, very difficult. If you have suspicion throughout the session before the person's even done anything, they haven't logged in, they haven't created an account, and they certainly haven't checked out yet, but you can sort of already keep an eye on them. And as they do those, you can you know, authenticate them more strongly. Maybe if they put in a username and password and you suspect that it's an account takeover, you can force a password reset if you're controlling that, right? Which is what Ping Identity does. We control that experience. We're managing that yes or no gateway to entry. We can force a password reset to the, to the email on file which means that the, you know, the legitimate user might be a little bit annoyed because right in an extra step, but they'll be appreciative of the right messaging. You actually helped really protect their account versus the frauds is not going to have access to that. The other thing that, that we use a lot of ping identity is MFA, multi-factor authentication, which means if I have suspicion when they've logged in, I say, hey, just to confirm it's you, just put the pin I just sent you on your phone. Just, just put that in here, right? A good user, takes two seconds, your phone, even if you're on your phone, it may even like on my iPhone, it's going to pre-populate that anyway. It's going to say, do you want to use the number you just got texted to you? You say yes, and it's done. The fraud obviously doesn't have access to that device. And so they're going to be blocked at that level, right? And allowing all of that sort of software mitigation along the way allows you that when you get to the checkout, you've got your good customers haven't really been impacted. I heard a lot of other presentation where they said, why would you do something when 99% of your traffic is good? And that's true, but you want to make sure that 1% doesn't end up costing you millions of dollars. And, and the fact that you do that, you know, soft along the way, makes it a much better user experience. So anybody familiar with ReCAPTCHA, right? ReCAPTCHA exists because systems are not very good at detecting whether you're a bot or not. So instead, they make human beings go through these ridiculous um, exercises. And you can see here on the right-hand side, 
uh, when you blow up a picture of the traffic lights, you know, do I click on the square that's there? Do I have to click on the post as well? Or is it just the light part they want? Like what's the, what part is it, the actual traffic light, right? And so as a, as a human, it's almost impossible, but actually we have image recognition technology that we had developed at Secure Touch that we showed companies like Google, actually a bot can get through that more easily than a human being because a bot can actually see that blow up and go pixel by pixel and figure out what looks like, you know, th there's so much technology here recognizing images um, that have been used throughout many different companies um, to be able to, you know, find people online, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that for them finding traffic lights, finding crosswalks, finding buses or bicycles, is actually not very difficult and a lot easier for them than a human being. And we know that the that um, you know this failure rates of three to eight percent on those. So you can imagine your good users. It's happened to me, and I'm sure many people can can say the same that it's happened to you that you couldn't get through a, through a recapture, which is really annoying. And I'll share some results at the end to see you know you don't it doesn't have to be that way, right? The next thing that 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 happens you know. When, when you're not monitoring throughout the session, is you get to the payment and something's off, right? This just happened to me actually last week. I was buying um, knobs for my kitchen and I wanted some antique knobs. And in America, they didn't have them, but they had them on a website in the UK. They said they shipped globally. And um, I uh, immediately got an email from them saying, sorry, your transaction's been declined. You've got to do it again. And I was a little bit upset, but I said, fine, I'll do it again. I called them up, said, it's me. I did the transaction again. And three days later, they called me and said, sir, we have two transactions for you. Are you do you want the double amount of what you ordered? And I said, no, you told me to do that. We said, well, in the meantime, the manual review team probably accepted it. And so as a user, it becomes really, really difficult um, to be, uh, you know, to to know what to do. And it's certainly very cumbersome. And if I had the opportunity to buy these, these were very specific, but I had the opportunity to buy them in other places, I certainly would have done that. And I've had this conversation as, as a Frenchman living in America, where I shop a lot on, on, on French or, or British websites. Um, I end up saying to them, you know, I shop on amazon.fr because I know they'll accept my transaction. If I shop on other websites and I'm buying a gift from my parents or something who live there, it's going to be significantly more difficult. Again, you're impacting a customer experience because you don't have enough information or because now you're holding this hot ball and you have to make a decision. Okay. And that's really, really doesn't have to be that way. And so how do you do it? Well, you move from a transaction centric model where you've got this transaction, you're trying to look at it to really a session centric model. And that's what a lot of businesses are doing today. And I would say that's true in, in e-commerce and it's true in banking. They're really focusing on the trust factor. You heard that in the description of Ping Identity. And that's really what we're all about. We're all about, can I trust this session? Can I trust what the person is doing? Do they have access to the right thing? And being able to do that very significantly and being able to do that in the best possible way is really, in our opinion, the best way to have a very seamless user experience. The user shouldn't have to go through even all of the things that I mentioned of MFA and you know, resetting password. Those should be things that are used in a very targeted way when you have a high level of certainty, 80 plus percent level of certainty that you're dealing with something bad, right? Not like companies that present recapture over and over and over of you or decline any transaction. I've had conversations with merchants that say, any cars that come from, and these are obviously not American merchants, any cars that come from America, I decline them, there's just too much fraud, right? And, and I say, but you've got a huge market of foreign, you know, foreigners from that country living in America who would love to use your website. And you're, you're not allowing them to do that. You're stopping some of your commerce for that reason. And so what matters the most is really you want to do is have the best customer experience possible to really prevent reputational damage, lower operational costs. I talked about that. If your team is calling people up or doing a ton of manual reviews, just because they don't have great information, they just have like, you know, the, the shipping doesn't match the billing zip or the even country, 
And I'm not really comfortable with that. And all of those things, you know, with, with global gifting and all of that, that that's really not a, a, a good solution. Um, and you've got to be able to reduce that friction, do that soft mitigations along the way. And this is really important because when fraud occurs, it's typically not a one-time event, right? And each account that's compromised is used 10 times and each fake account is used five times, right? So not only being able to stop it is important because otherwise they're going to do it. If you don't stop it the first time, they're going to do it the second, third, fourth, and fifth time, right? And so being able to, to control that is, is very important. The other area that, that we see a lot is, is customers and many uh, e-commerce merchants want to provide some kind of reward, right? The airline started that, you know, whatever, 30, 40 years ago, um, providing points, but there's so many um, companies like from Amazon to, to any others that provide some kind of, um, you know, um, uh, loyalty uh, points uh, that have a monetary value to them that you can then, um, you know, and, and fraudsters will do a lot, if they can get a hold of 10,000 usernames and passwords, and just do some skimming, right? Where, where they choose the accounts that have heavy usage and they just skim a bit off the top, right? And if you're like me and you're a heavy international traveler, I don't know how many miles, if someone took 500 miles here and there, probably take me, you know, maybe after a year I would notice it, but I certainly wouldn't notice it the first or second month. I don't go in and look at every single transaction or everything that happens, right? Because airlines have become so good at like, hey, you get 10 points if you order a lift on, on Delta, you know, you get 10 points if you stay at the Marriott Hotel, you get, so you, you're always constantly accumulating points and then you might use points for, you know, a magazine subscription or whatever. So your ins and outs are very logical and fraudsters really um, uh, capitalize on that, right? So to recap, behavioral data is really key. And I think um, you heard that, you know, obviously in, in, the, in like the BioCatch com conversation or presentation that we had, but it's really important. Some of the things that we see is that typically a fraud is going to have a lot more familiarity with your website than even your best users, right? Because they assume that they're going to have to try a hundred times before they can succeed versus legitimate user assumes that they're going to be able to succeed hundred percent of the time. And so the behavior is very different. The fraudster, if they behave like a, a normal user, wouldn't be able to monetize and make enough money, right? On the other hand, they don't have familiarity with the data. You can type your name faster than anyone else can. Your, even your browser may populate. If I put an A in my browser, it's going to automatically populate my name and even my name and my, my last name and my address and my phone number and my email, right? Uh, most browsers do that today. Uh, a fraudster is going to copy and paste. When was the last time you had to copy and paste to write your first and last name? You know, that, that, that's slower than, than you just spelling it out. And so, you know, the data familiarity discrepancy with the site familiarity discrepancy, all of those things, you know, we have tremendously powerful AI today, and we can recognize that those, those are not, not uh, you know, a good thing. The same with, with uh, uh, you know, detecting automatic tools. A lot of these tools have become very sophisticated of integrating, you know, cloning behavioral data and all of that, because they know that, that uh, you know, companies like us exist. But it's very, very hard for them to match everything up one to one, right? And we'll see things like, you know, someone clicking on one pixel on the phone, humanly impossible, even with a pen. You can't click on one pixel. Phones now have so many pixels, uh, or, or even click on one pixel seven times in a row, right? Which is, you know, you have more chance of winning the lottery seven times in a row than clicking on one pixel seven times in a row. And so all of those things, you know, are really, really important to understand as you have your users navigating the sessions. And, and also across sessions, right? Have I seen this guy before? Do I recognize this pattern? So that you can tell your customer when you have like fraud ring attacks, right? You'll see in some cases, a merchant may have 10,000 attacks. They actually will come from the same place. It's just one scheme. You gotta be able to recognize a pattern. If you don't recognize a pattern to them, it just looks like, you know, 10,000 attacks, uh, isolated attacks, right? When in reality, if you stop that one attack, you stop those 10,000, um, you know, anomalies. So here's what it means from a numbers perspective, right? When we have ping one fraud deployments, um, I mentioned recapture and you hate it. You know, some of our customers have been able to drop the usage of recapture by 98%. And remember three to 8% uh, abandonment rate when you use recapture, right? So being able to drop that by 98% means that you have a lot less friction on, on logins. Right, 90% of, of uh, detection before checkout 
um, right? That's really important. When someone logs in, we were able to say, this looks malicious before they even checked out in 90% of the time, just from their behavior. Fraudsters want specific things. They want to look at what you've bought before so that they buy in the same pattern. They want to look at what the address is shipping to. They potentially want to change the address uh, and all those kinds of things. 400% um, increase in bot detection at login. The reason for that is that most bot tools use bot signatures to be able to do that. We don't, we use, we try and detect human behavior. And if we don't see human behavior, we know it's a bot. And there's two types of bot, right? There's bots that hit your website directly and there's API direct bots. And API direct bots, it's really important to be able to, to detect those because otherwise everything you're putting on your website is gonna be useless because the fraud is just going around your website and attacking directly your APIs. And so many customers are not even so familiar with what all of the APIs do and they don't really have them protected. And Ping really has a suite of solutions that can monitor and, and tell you everything that's going on and tell you that you've got open APIs that you didn't even know you had and all of those types of things to, to really uh, be able to detect that. And then a 62% uh, percent decrease in fraud detection, um, which is mainly new account fraud. And again, typically new account fraud is, is leverage. You know, someone's going to create an account, leave it dormant, and, and, and after that, later down the road, be able to, to monetize it when the timing is right.